I think as we think about what we need to do going forward, um, it, it, we first have to recognize some very simple principles. Um, the first is our very limited power to determine the, the course of political change in large countries or in any country. Um, I still read now people writing complicated scenarios about how we can determine um, how the, the current political crisis in Pakistan will come out, whether we support this party or this party, or push this, do this, do that. It should have become pretty clear of what happened over the course of the last several months already that our ability to determine a political outcome um, is, is extremely small. And a policy that's built on attempting to do that is almost certainly going to be a disappointment, if not an outright failure. So that's, that's number one. And of course that goes to the question, well, let, let's say as, as principle number two, it is to recognize that right now, that while democracy may be always a good, uh, as the president says, freedom is better than anything else, true. Um, but timing is important, and readiness for democracy is important. And democracy may be a very bad thing to be introduced at a particular, pushed at a particular moment, certainly bad for U.S. interests, I mean, as it has been in the region recently. Everywhere there have been elections, forces inimical to our interests have been elected. And uh, that has not gone unnoticed in other regions, um, activist Islamist groups now view elections as their most attractive tool to advance their own power. Uh, because they did in Palestine with, uh, with the victory of Hamas. They have done in, in Egypt with the uh, victory of the Muslim Brotherhood, etc. We have to be very smart and realistic about when conditions are ripe for it and how long it takes for fundamental political change to happen. I think that was the that was the core mistake of, of the Bush administration. This notion that somehow fundamental political change can happen overnight and happen at outside instigation um, was, was historically blind and, and obviously phony. And look how long it took to get um, an imperfect still democracy in the United States and how long it took before more than half of the people in this country had the vote, for, for heaven's sakes and in every other place where democracy has evolved over the years. It does take a recognition that the simplistic um, formula that the Bush administration developed, that now our interests and our values are one, um, was an illusion. Um, there are many times and in many places where our values um, are steady but our short-term interests require that we act with a certain um, a recognition of re political realities on the ground and a much greater sense of the limits of what any outside power can do. Any outside power. It doesn't matter how, uh, how, how powerful they are. The third principle for, for that should shape our ongoing policy in the Middle East is a, a much clearer understanding that military power does not translate into directly into political influence, political power. They're different things. And that, that question then, political power, political influence, our ability to, to influence the course of events, I, I probably leads us to principle number four, which is that we have to care about legitimacy. We have to care and to recognize that it matters how the rest of the world sees us and judges us, um, which will determine whether the rest of the world sees our actions as having been legitimate or not. Um, the fact is that most of the world, and we knew this in advance, saw our invasion of Iraq as illegitimate. It was uh, not preemptive of an imminent threat, but it was preventive war, um, unilaterally declared, and that is not a legitimate form of international action. So. Um, we have to care about legitimacy going forward because it determines our ability to lead 
because it will determine whether we have any followers. And then I, I would also put down the centrality of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the political mind of the region. Um, there is a view here that Arab governments simply use, don't really care at all about the Palestinians, which is often true, and use that conflict as an excuse to divert attention from their own failings. Well, there's a good deal of truth in that, but it's only a partial truth, because the fact is um, that they do use it and can use it, and will be able to continue to use it. Um, they can't use it if it's not there, uh, if there is some kind of a settlement. But much more importantly, that throughout the Arab world, uh, there is a view that an, an enormous injustice was done to the Palestinian people. Um, in part, I would argue, because of their own failings, um, their own unwillingness to accept compromise, fine. But nonetheless, there it is on the ground. And we're not going to find, I think, any stable road to peace as long as region-wide, as long as that conflict festers. And I think one of the most important points that was made in in the Carnegie's uh, new, new Middle East report that recently came out was that the conditions for allowing a two-state solution to be achieved are rapidly evaporating. That in order to have a two-state solution, you have to have two contiguous pieces of geography. You have to have two p political entities which you no longer have on the Palestinian side, able to exercise control and represent the sovereign interests of those two people. You have to have political will on both sides, and all of that is disappearing. Um, so time is not on our sides on that. And um, these seven, eight lost years uh, are extraordinarily costly um, f for us and, and for the region for the world.